Did everybody get the email from Linda on Saturday? Did you read it? <laughs> In it, she said, let's continue to pray for the teacher this week. If you have read through the chapter, you know what kind of wisdom and grace she needs to talk about submission. <laughs> so, Coretta cast the lots. And the lot fell on me. So we'll see um, how this all works out today. Before we get into chapter 11, Dr. Wearsby defined a couple of biblical terms. And I'd like to talk about these before we actually get into the chapter. One of the terms is baptized by the Spirit. When a person trusts Christ as Savior, he is immediately baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. This is a once-for-all experience that takes place at conversion. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So we have this term, baptized by the Spirit. Then he goes on to introduce the term, which is really covered in our lesson today, filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit means to be constantly controlled by the Spirit in our mind, emotions, and will. To be filled with the Spirit is God's command, and He expects us to obey. We usually think of the power of the Spirit as necessary for preaching and witnessing, and this is true. But Paul wrote that the Spirit's fullness is also needed in the home. If our homes are to be heaven on earth, then we must be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So we have two terms. Baptized by the Spirit, which happens once at the moment of salvation. And then we have filled with the Spirit, which is our lesson for today, being constantly controlled by the Spirit in our mind, our emotions, and our will. In fact, being filled with the Spirit is in the present tense, meaning keep on being filled by the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ once, filled with the Spirit a continual process that we work at, work for and work after day by day. In Ephesians 5.18, our first verse for today, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. There's the command. Now before we talk about that, let's talk about the Holy Spirit Himself for just a moment. Let's review a little bit about him, the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is a person, the third member of the Trinity, equal in every way to God the Father and God the Son. Among, among the many characteristics of personhood that the Holy Spirit exhibits are these. He functions with mind, emotion, and will. He loves the saints. He communicates with them teaches them, guides, comforts, and chastises them. And you know, ladies, if we stopped, we could probably assign in each person a verse here, and you could look up these characteristics, and we could read a verse to back them up. Number four on the list, he can be grieved, quenched, lied to, tested, resisted, and blasphemed. He indwells all believers, illuminating their understanding and their application of God's Word. And then look at number six. He fills them, seals them, communes with them, fellowships with them, intercedes for them, comforts them, admonishes them, sanctifies them, and enables them to resist sin and serve God. Well, shouldn't we have a, a new appreciation or at least be reminded of the, the office of the Holy Spirit and, and all these amazing things that he does for us 
In Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself, itself, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, this filling of the Spirit that we are just now beginning to talk about, uh, I found this story uh, written by David Jeremiah, and I thought it really fit here as far as, far as what we were talking about. <coughs> A critical ingredient of daily life for believers is being consistently filled with the Holy Spirit. To be Spirit-filled means to be Christ-centered. It means we yield ourselves fully to the Lord each day, allowing the indwelling Spirit to control and empower us. Being filled with something is a powerful force. Now listen what he says here. When I was a teenager, I delivered newspapers in Dayton, Ohio. Any of you remember newspapers? <laughs> or the news boys, usually in my neighborhood, it was a young boy on a bicycle who rode by and tossed a newspaper into our yard each afternoon. And if he didn't, my father would have been upset because he looked forward to that newspaper every day. So, uh, Dr. Jeremiah says, among my customers was a surly man who frightened me. When a newspaper landed on the grass, he called the publisher and complained. <laughs> One Halloween, my buddies and I decided to play a trick on him. We crept up to his house in the dark, every nerve taut. For some reason, he was expecting us, and he jumped out of the bushes yelling and throwing tin cans. <laughs> I took off down the street, dashing across Woodman Avenue, and hurling a fence into a cornfield. I never touched the fence. I just jumped right over it and kept running. The next day on that paper route, I stopped and looked at that fence. It was so tall, I couldn't imagine how I jumped over it. But I did jump over it because I was filled with fear. When a powerful surge force surges through us, we have a power that controls and enables us to do things we couldn't otherwise do. Now, here's the part I'd like for you to remember. Imagine starting each day being filled with the Holy Spirit. Imagine waking up and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Confessing and forsaking all known sin, I commit myself to using every moment today for serving you. May I be fully controlled and empowered by your Holy Spirit. Wow, what a, what a morning prayer. Well, believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit will, in verse 19, be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said, we, thought, we should have thought that Paul would have said, singing and making melody with your voice to the Lord. But the apostle, guided by the Holy Ghost, overlooks the sound, which is the mere body of the praise, and looks to the heart, which is the living soul of the praise. We all read the book of Psalms, have them, many of them memorized, and it is filled with some divinely inspired musical um, renditions that we can sing in praise to the Lord. In Psalm 147.7, we see the command, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, sing praise upon the harp unto our God. And in the New Testament, in Romans 15, 9, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Or as the NIV interprets it, 
I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. We find another command in verse 20. A believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit will be giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in the old days we would hear or hear stories from the Bible, missionaries who would come and, and visit our churches about leprosy mm -hmm. and about those who minister to lepers in foreign countries. Uh, they set up leper colonies where lepers can come in for uh, treatment to, be, to have a place to go, a safe place to live. Well, in the ancient world, when Jesus was here, there was no such thing as a leper colony. People with leprosy were just outcasts. And in Luke 17, verses 12 through 18, we read, As he entered into a village, now this is Jesus, our Lord, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. And they lifted their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found, or, or were there not any more found that returned to give glory to God save this stranger? How often are all of us ladies sitting here in this room today uh, like the nine? We, we pray and we ask for God's help. And then when he answers, we promptly forgive him to give, forget to give him thanks. Our minds just sort of say, well, it probably would have happened anyway. Or we make some other excuses for not giving the credit and the glory to God. But the verse says, giving thanks always. Now, the next part, for all things. That's not so easy. In fact, that's the hardest part of obeying this command. Dr. Wiersbe says, to be sure, all of us are grateful for some things at some special occasions, but Paul commands his readers to be thankful for all things at all times. Can you do that? Oh, that's, that's a, a hard one. This exhortation itself proves our need of the Spirit of God because in our own strength we could never obey this commandment. Psalm 34, 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And then the very familiar 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Well, let's move to verse 21. Here's another command. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. To submit is to voluntarily surrender one's rights, not out of subservience or servility, but out of willingness to function under the other's leadership. Paul introduces his teaching about specific relationships of authority and submission among Christians by declaring unequivocally that every spirit-filled Christian needs to be a humble, submissive Christian. No believer is inherently superior to any other believer. In their standing before God, they are equal in every way. But God requires every believer to be submissive in the ways that He has ordained. In Galatians 3, 26-28, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. 
For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And what did we just read? God requires every believer to be submissive in the ways that he has ordained. Well, what are some of the ways? Peter gives us some. Peter in 1 Peter 2, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors, or unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So, Do we pay our taxes on April 15th? Uh, do we pull over when we see the blue light? We... Uh, Obey 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, if we do. In 1 Peter 2, 18, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward, or the stubborn, or the willful, or the defiant. Um, we may not be slaves or uh, servants subject to masters, but most all of us have had a job, <laughs> and we've had a boss that... Uh, may have exhibited some of these qualities at some time. So, does that apply to employers? Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Do we submit? Yes. In 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. And then leaving Peter and moving over to Hebrews, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Back in 1981, Ronald Reagan was the President of the United States. And one day and during the summer of 1981 he was giving a speech at the Washington Hilton and when the speech was over he came out of the hotel onto the sidewalk ready to step into the limousine that was waiting there for him and if you remember your history a man by the name of John Hinckley Jr. shot him. The bullet went in under his left underarm it punctured a lung, broke a rib, and caused serious internal bleeding for the president. Many years later, at his funeral, President George Bush was speaking, and he told this story concerning Ronald Reagan's humility. Remember the verse that we just read? Be clothed with humility. For the Lord resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. President George Bush described President Reagan in the hospital after he was shot in an assassination attempt. And here's what the President Bush said at Reagan's funeral. Days after being shot, weak from wounds, he, that's President Reagan, spilled water from a sink. And entering the hospital room, aides saw him on his hands and knees wiping water from the floor. He was worried that his nurse would get into trouble. So the President of the United States has enough humility and enough concern for those who serve him uh, to be down on the floor wiping up the water. The model for complete humility and gentleness is Jesus. If Jesus our Lord had the humility to submit himself unto death, how much more ought we to live in humility and submission to each other? Romans 12.10, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. And in Philippians 2.13, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let us esteem others better than themselves. Well, ladies, 
we are moving to verses <laughs> that I think Linda was referring to in, in her email last week. Um, I read a story uh, from a book by Charles Swindoll, and in his story he was telling about a little girl who came home from kindergarten, and she said, Mommy, the teacher read us a story of Snow White today. And the mother said, okay, well, well, tell me about it. And the little girl began to relate the story. And she got to the part where Prince Charming rode up on his white horse and he kissed Snow White and he brought her back to life. And then the little girl says to her mother, and mommy, you know what happened then? And the mother said, of course I do, honey. They lived happily ever after. And the little girl said, no, they got married. <laughs> so this little girl, she spoke the truth sometimes without really knowing it. Uh, getting married and living happily after our, after our, I can't say the words, ever after are not necessarily synonymous. But Paul gives us the instructions, starting with verse 22, and then going on through the end of the chapter, how marriage can be unhappy, happily ever after. And he starts with wives, and then he moves on to the husbands. In Ephesians 5, to 24, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now this next paragraph I, um, I put in here, this is from uh, James and Shirley Dobson's book, on uh, a devotional book on marriage. And I put it in here because I thought it was uh, beautifully written. And we are talking about wives, but actually it could probably be applied both ways. Love can be defined in myriad ways, but in marriage, I love you means I promise to be there for you all my days. It's a promise that says, I'll be there when you lose your job, your health, your parents, your looks, your confidence, your friends. It's a promise that tells your partner, I'll build you up. I'll overlook your weaknesses. I'll forgive your mistakes. I'll put your needs above my own. I'll stick by you even when the going gets tough. The Lord himself has demonstrated throughout the ages that he keeps his promises. Since God keeps his promises, we must keep ours too, especially the one we made before God, our family, and our friends on our wedding day. I think that the Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect example of submission. Look at Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Is that not the perfect example of submission? Elizabeth George says it this way. The next time your sin nature tugs at you to disrespect your husband or fail to follow him, think of your Lord. Jesus is your example. He willingly submitted to the Father's will, not because he was forced to, but because he chose to, 
because of his love for the Father. God is asking you to respect and submit to your husband out of love and respect for God himself. Your submission to your husband is actually your submission to your Lord. What did I just read in those verses? Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, verse 22. If you obey God's plan and follow Christ's example, you will be following God's design for your marriage. A perfect design. Strong words, right ladies? Verse 22, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. As the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Well, wives, let's move on to husbands. I just read this paragraph by James Dobson, which I thought was very emotional and, and touching. I really liked that. Uh, can we move to the other end of the spectrum? Uh, Dave, James Dobson, in that book that I read, tells the story of a wedding ceremony. I don't think this has really, really happened. <laughs> a wedding ceremony of a young contract lawyer and his bride. So they're standing before the minister, and the minister says, do you take this woman for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. And there's a moment of silence and the groom says, yes, no, yes, no, no, yes. <laughs> he was uh, a little startled to hear the groom respond that way. Wouldn't we all have liked to have signed up for the better? <laughs> Not the worse, the richer, not the poorer, the healthy, and not the sickness. But that's not the way marriage works because that's not the way that life works. In verses 25 through 29, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish, nourisheth and cherisheth cherisheth it even as the Lord the church from these verses um, I have pulled out from verse 25 and 26 and 27 and this was Dr. Wearsby's model if you were um, when you read your chapter and you studied your lesson Dr. Wearsby says Christ's love for the church is established as the model for a husband's love for his wife. And then he points out these three characteristics. The husband's love should be a sacrificial love. Okay, this is the husband's role, a sacrificial love. As, in verse 25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we have the husband, sacrificial love, as Christ loved the church. The comparison there. The husband's love should be a sanctifying love or set apart that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So again here, the husband and wife are set apart. It is a cleansing love, so they are becoming more like Christ. On the other side, Christ is cleansing his church. The word of God is used as a cleansing agent. 
And the third command for the husband that, that Dr. Wearsby says, the husband's love should be a satisfying love that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and blemish without blemish isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit chose the husband's love for his wife and Christ's love for the church and puts, puts these two in these verses that we have just read to teach us how Christ's love for the church is the model for a husband's love for his wife. In verses 30 through 33, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. In Dr. Stuart Custer's book on Ephesians, I, I saw this phrase. Every saved believer is a member of the body of Christ. We just read that in verse 30. The grace of the Lord Jesus in taking the church as his body is beyond human imagination. And then I love this next sentence. The Lord loved us is the only explanation. We, it's beyond our comprehension. We can't, we can't take it in. We are members of his body, his flesh, and his bones. The grace of the Lord Jesus in taking the church as his body is beyond human imagination. Verse 31 reminds us of the scriptural basis for marriage that Jesus gave us in Mark chapter 10. Jesus said, From the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. Wherefore God hath joined, what therefore God hath joined, to get, joined together, let not man put asunder. So Jesus gave this command in Mark, and then Paul repeats it in verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. In verse 32, Paul said, that marriage is to be a reflection of the relationship between Christ and his church. But look what he calls it. This is a great mystery. We really can't quite take it in or, or, or understand it all yet. But then Paul goes on to say, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. It's difficult for us believers to understand the implications of this doctrine. Uh, the relationship between Christ and his church is revealed in these verses that we just read is a great mystery. Paul uses the husband and the wife as putting, I guess, in our everyday terms and bringing this great mystery of Christ and the church down to earth when he says, the husband is to love the wife as he loves himself, and the wife is to see that she reverence her husband. Dr. Wearsby concludes chapter 11 with, with these thoughts. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to work in our lives. If we read Colossians 3, 16 through 4, 1, we will see a parallel to the Ephesians passage, and um, some of you probably did that. As you will note, that to be filled with the Word of God produces joy. What do we read in verse 19? Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It produces thanksgiving. We got that command in verse 20. 
giving thanks always for all things. And submission? Well, we saw that in verses 21 through 24. First, submitting yourselves one to another. And second, wives submitting yourselves to your husbands. In other words, when you are controlled by the Word of God, you are filled with the Spirit of God. Not only husbands and wives, but all Christians need to spend time daily letting the Word of Christ dwell in them richly. For then the Spirit of God can work in our lives to make us joyful, thankful, and submissive. And this means heaven in the home or wherever God may put us. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you for these commands that you have given to us. We know they are for our own good because you love us. Thank you for each of these ladies here and their lives. And I pray that as we leave to go our separate ways today that we might keep some of these scriptures in our hearts and in our minds to be conscious of your commands and the things that you have told us to obey. Because then we know that we will be happy and that we will be living according to your directives and according to your will. I pray that you might be with us as we go our separate ways now in Jesus' name. Amen.